Thank you all for uh, coming. I know you're not interested in the movie. You're just coming to hear me speak about psilocybin and so forth. Uh, and I, I guarantee you, just as uh, Vice President Gore uh, testified, uh, he never inhaled and none of us ever participated, uh, even in our college years in Boston. So this is, uh, this is a great movie. I've seen it and you're in for a treat. Uh, I'd like to thank Beth Gilligan for inviting me uh, to talk a little bit about some of the science. It's a, exciting opportunity, um, the major mission of the National Institutes of Health has to do, and the National Science Foundation, has to do with science outreach. Because our tax dollars, your tax dollars, all of that goes to support the scientific research that's so important to the advancement of public health. So my, my, you know, my goal, what I've been asked to do was to um, discuss uh, some of the underpinnings uh, that that go into the scientific aspects of, as was just mentioned, almost almost clarified in the movie, without giving away any um, giving giving away any aspect of the story. So I will try to do that. So here, in this uh, first slide, this is the young you'll see is the young Karamakate. Uh, and I entitled this, uh, In Search of Spirit. You can't hear me? Oh, okay, sorry. Is it, pick up the mic, uh, all right. I normally walk around when I lecture, I normally walk around with a little thing on me, so I, I like to be a little kinetic, so I won't be able to be tonight. Let me, I'll unwind this. And there are definitely some serpentine wires here. And I, okay, I think I can, if we can free, can we free this wire up a little bit? Get this one. Thanks. There we go. All right, now I can move. All right, thanks. All right, so this is the, the young, as you'll see soon, this is the young Karamakate. Uh, in real life, he's actually a farmer. And, and I understand from reading a little bit about this that he wanted to be the star of the movie in order to be in it, and somehow they convinced him to get off the farm uh, to, to be the actor. Uh, and he's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful character. But I entitled this The Search of Spirit from Shaman to Psychotropics because it really is about, this movie really, at least in my opinion, from what I identify with this movie, is really about what we're all in search of. We're all in search of what is inside of us, asking those fundamental questions. Uh, why am I here? What am I about? What am I going to do? Can I understand myself? We're both blessed as homo sapiens with the ability to be self-aware, and we're also at the same time cursed by it, in that we are aware that our time on this planet is limited. And during that time, we seek spirit. It comes in many forms. It comes as organized religion. It comes as individual identity. And I see that, in, in my mind, that's what this movie is about. Well, it starts in about 1912. And the movie starts with Theodor Koch Grunberg, who was a German ethnologist. So that's a person who's interested in different ethnicities. He was very interested in the indigenous peoples of the Amazon uh, forest, rainforest. So he spent his professional life uh, in the Amazon, and he was an explorer in this general area of Colombia and Brazil uh, in the early 20th century, and he meets this shaman, uh, Karamakate. And this is the actual photograph of him. Unfortunately, this laser pointer is fading out on me. But this is, the, this is, this is uh, Koch Grunberg right here uh, in, during his, uh, I guess, adventure and his explorations. And this is how it's portrayed in the movie, uh, quite nicely. And this is very rewarding to see how uh, the, the director and the producers of the movie uh, tried to uh, adhere to the actual facts of his uh, explorations. Here's the uh, Theodor Koch Grunberg with, uh, with Karamakati. 
uh, during one of their expeditions in 1912. And here's Kara uh, Makate, uh, not quite as handsome uh, as the uh, first image, uh, but definitely a shaman. And here's uh, Kutch Grunberg, uh, I believe shoeless, as we can see over there. Uh, sitting down, and I, I also note, having taken uh, a little yoga, that he's able to sit very, uh, very in a very low chair and seem comfortable, as they, they typically do in the Amazon. Uh, and actually, I was impressed that, that the shaman was actually sitting on something, because uh, when I go to yoga, they, they make us try to sit on the floor without a chair, and I can never do that. I always roll backwards. I don't know what it is. But... So 30 years later, right around 1942, and of course the world is at war, um, uh, Schultes, uh, who's, who's an ethnobotanist, so he's interested in plants that are associated with different ethnicities, and he also goes to the Amazon, and he's really being paid to seek a source of rubber because the supply of rubber products to the Allies has been cut off by, by the war in the, in the East, in Asia, or reduced uh, due to access. And he's, his uh, scientific interests are in the area of psychotropics. So in the movie, this is the aging Karamakate. Uh, so he's, he's now, and I won't mention what is going on in his life, but he's, he's the aged uh, shaman and there's quite a bit of focus in the movie on the spiritual connection with the forest, which uh, is what I was referring to earlier. And, and this is quite typical of the shaman. Uh, they're indigenous religious leaders. They believe they can communicate with and learn from plants and nature in general. And this is something that we all experience when we go into the rainforest or any natural environment. We experience that very special spiritual feeling, and, and, and that's what this movie is, has, uh, I think, illustrated brilliantly. So here's the real Evan Schultes uh, in the rainforest, and he's a scientist. He was uh, from Harvard. Uh, Boston is, as in many things, uh, a leader in, in areas of discovery, uh, I guess even in psychotropics. But uh, he's, he's exploring, and then Here's in the movie, here he is speaking to the aged Karamakate, and he becomes very ill. And the part that the pharmacology comes in is how the shaman uh, tries to treat him. So what might they have been using? And we don't really know for sure what he was using, but what might they have been using? We do know that he, he uh, at some point had uh, malaria. So these are some of the, uh, I mean, there are, hundreds of thousands of natural products in the Amazon, uh, Amazonian uh, uh, rainforest. But these are some of the ones that he might have used for an analgesic. It could have been morphine, for psychotropic psilocybin. I'll be talking about that. That's, uh, psilocybin is produced by a fungus, a mushroom, uh, otherwise known as magic mushrooms, uh, <laughs> and culturally. Psychostimulants, cocaine, very prevalently used uh, in the Amazon. Uh, from a leafy plant and anti-malarial quinine, which can be extracted from tree bark. So now let's skip ahead a little bit into the modern world and the, the pharmacology. So in the human brain, the, the serotonin is a neurotransmitter. Uh, chakruna, so here's the structure of serotonin. It's a neurotransmitter. And the blue indicates uh, the carbon skeleton, which is joined together by bonds. And uh, here's a little OH group, which is kind of two-thirds of water, H2O. Here's a hydro it's called a hydroxyl group. Now, Chakruna, which is referred to in this, in this movie, but not necessarily by name, uh, contains dimethyltryptamine, which is this molecule here, NN-dimethyltryptamine. And you can see, you don't have to know chemistry to see in the blue area, the similarity between the structure of the active ingredient in chakruna, uh, chakruna, excuse me, and the neurotransmitter serotonin's backbone. So that's that's really marvelous. And of course, uh, the shaman knew to use chakruna, but they didn't know that there was dimethyltryptamine in there. But it still worked, so it was good enough for them. 
uh, magic mushrooms contain psilocybin, and you can see from the blue area that psilocybin has great similarity to serotonin. With, there are some other groups here, and there's this phosphate group here, which in the human body is removed. The phosphate group is removed, and we end up with a psilocin, which is the active component of psilocybin. And that is important, and I'm going to refer to that in the next slides. So here's the plant. If we just look at it, if you or I just walk through the rainforest and we look at this plant, it's just a nice leafy plant. We might want to chew on it and, and we might feel something. It's actually, uh, as a result, it's actually called Psychotria viridis. And the viridis just means green in Latin. I just looked that up today because I was wondering what it was. I thought it was going to be something more exotic, but the Psychotria is uh, obvious. Uh, so. The shaman would know how to identify those plants. Uh, and then there's ayahuasca, which is referred to in the movie. And this can, ayahuasca, this is where it gets, I think, really interesting, um, at least for me. Uh, it contains harmala alkaloids. Again, just a little leafy plant on a tree, uh, except to the shaman who knows what to do with it. And it contains, among other things, uh, these alkaloids, harmine and harmaline, which you may have heard of, and these are reversible monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So these uh, drugs, these compounds, when we eat some of these compounds, there or we take a drug, a therapeutic agent, the liver detoxifies them, and one of the main uh, mechanisms for detoxification is, is the enzyme, it's a whole class of enzymes, but for the moment I'll just refer to it as one enzyme, monoamine oxidase. So if that enzyme is inhibited, or class of enzymes is inhibited, the agent will accumulate in the, in the body, and, and thus in the brain as well. If, then it also contains, very interestingly, a weak inhibitor of serotonin reuptake, this other compound, tetrahydroharmine. Now, what else do we know about inhibiting uh, serotonin reuptake? And I, I mean, get to this in, in the next slide, or the slide after this one, that is that there are SSRIs. Has everybody heard of SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors? They're a major product, you know, in our society, worth billions of dollars each year for the inhibition of serotonin reuptake to treat depression and anxiety. Well, the shaman knew about this a long time ago, and unfortunately, they never formed a startup company. <laughs> they should have come to Boston, because we're the startup company capital of the world, I think. Or if we're not, we should be. Well, we think we are, you know? So, but anyway, what, what they did, the indigenous shaman at work would take this, they would create what's called a decoction. And this is gonna be described, you're gonna see this in the movie. And so the key is that it, the extraction process is very important in terms of forming the, the active agent. And you'll see at one point, the aged uh, shaman is trying to remember how to create the therapeutic mixture. And that's a very interesting scene, which I won't talk about. But when you see that, think of this. He has to remember how to take chakruna which has the hallucinogen, hallucinogen DMT, dimethyltryptamine, and extract it and combine it in this decoction with ayahuasca, which has the monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and to get the full effect, to get this vision, this window on spirit. 30 years later, now, Good Friday, 1962, back to Boston, uh, psilocybin, uh, Magic Mushrooms, Timothy Leary, Harvard Divinity School, and Boston University. <laughs> there was the BU Marsh Chapel experiment of 1962. I was not there. <laughs> Walter N. Pas Pankey and Timothy Leary of the Harvard Divinity School designed an experiment and carried it out here in Boston uh, where they administered 30 milligrams of psilocybin and then niacin as a control experiment to student volunteers. There was a long line longer than getting into this theater to participate in this experiment. Uh, and nobody will admit to it today that they were there. But, uh, so, but people reported after this that they had uh, a really amazing, enlightening religious experience. 
what they characterize as a religious experience. Um, and uh, there is a sad story associated, just as an aside, that uh, Walter Pankey was doing his doctoral thesis. He eventually became an MD and uh, unfortunately died at 41 in a, in a, in a diving uh, while doing uh, snorkeling, I guess, or scuba diving off the coast of Maine. But he, had, he, uh, he ended up with a productive life, and many of the people who participated the, in this had productive lives, and there was evidently no adverse outcomes. So back to the future. Um, today, another April day, now 2016. Don't worry about all these structures. Uh, I just, just briefly wanted to show you what the pathway is for the metabolism of psilocybin to psilocin. It's a, just a, an enzyme alkaline phosphatase. And the key thing here is that ayahuasca inhibits at this stage. So psilocin accumulates, and that's the psychoactive uh, uh, molecule. So in modern concept, uh, we know this to be acting at a synapse, the, the serotonin synapse. This is the SSRI over here inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, the natural neurotransmitter. And when that happens, uh, there's an accumulation of serotonin in the synapse. And you can see here that these little widgets dock in the receptor, and so they act for a longer period of time, and thus there's more of an effect of serotonin in response to this drug. Uh, with regard to the movie uh, and the shaman, they would use chacruna, which is an agonist at those same receptors. It's going to soup up the system. And ayahuasca to inhibit degradation. It's the same effect. It accumulates serotonin. It's all working through the same mechanism. And now if you're Synthes if, you take, if, if, if someone is taking LSD, it's a synthetic compound, it would bind with high affinity to these receptors and really soup it up. Okay, so to summarize, we have melancholy. An individual might have melancholy, maybe, you know, a little more than normal. Uh, there's a little bit of serotonin there. Uh, it takes an SSRI. He's happy, as are the investors in the company making the SSRI, and you notice the shape of a pill. Uh, I'm a pharmacologist, so we have, everything is in the shape of a pill. Uh, ideally a blue pill in that, in that shape. Uh, psilocybin mushroom, uh, now he's really happy. There's even more serotonin, and he might get the seeds of the gods, ayahuasca, from a provider somewhere. I don't know where that would be. And if you take that, even on the SSRI, he's going to be extremely happy. So this, this shows that, that our, our, our mental, our emotional state can be modulated very effectively, whether it's by traditional herbal medicines or by modern pharmaceuticals. Um, and we, we bemoan the fact that these tribes, uh, like I said, didn't patent these uh, uh, well, they probably wouldn't have been able to, but that's a whole other story. But, well, so here, this, what I'd like to do is, I was asked to talk a little bit about, just very briefly, about the future, where it's going. So that's easy, because it's easy to talk about that, uh, because we're at the most exciting stage, I think, of neuroscience and neuropharmacology that's imaginable, at least for me. The, uh, President Obama's Human Brain Project, a Human Brain Mapping Project, uh, is dedicated to mapping the circuitry of the human brain, and people argue about whether that makes sense or not. But in any case, whatever we find out, uh, knowing what the wiring diagrams are going to be and how that uh, correlates with where these drug targets are and neurotransmitter targets is going to be very informative in terms of understanding how these perceptions are, uh, are formed. We can know what the wiring diagrams are. We can know what the drug effects are, but what we don't know is how can we possibly be self-aware? How can we pass, how do these images form in our nervous systems so we know who we are and where we are and where we're going and how do we feel? What do we think about things? All these emotional reactions that we have are pretty amazing and to try to understand that, can we understand it even based on computational uh, methods? So that's where I think the exciting, the really exciting new advances are going to be. I'm not sure if it'll be in my lifetime, but, uh, but
but that's where it'll, it'll be. Maybe in in a hundred years, or maybe even thirty years, uh, we'll be uh, understanding this much better. So I'd like to leave you just with when the modern world meets the old world, we find out more about uh, where we are. Well, no, she's not in Kansas, and neither are we. And uh, so, the the reason for that clip is is that I, at least in my mind, it's it's a. If we, depends on how we think about it. Uh, I wouldn't think about it necessarily as a person under the influence of a psychotropic, but as the uh, for the, the, but for the for the shaman, there is that connection with the. There really is that connection with the tree, with the fruit of the tree. And there's a reality of that connection, and that's what I'd like to leave you with.